Hello, my name's Rory Ridley Duff, uh, and I'm going to provide you with a lecture on corporate social responsibility and ethics. I work at Sheffield Hallam as professor of cooperative social entrepreneurship. So I, I study cooperatives, I study social enterprises and the social economy. And all of those types of enterprises have a particular approach to ethical business. So I'll be using that experience and that research in the course of this lecture. So uh, the slides are on Blackboard um, and this video accompanies those slides, but I will be showing you those slides as I go through this lecture. Let me just share my screen with you. So I'm building on the work of Ian Storer, um, who prepared these slides in the first place. And what I'm going to do is talk first about regulations. We, as a society, we create laws that seek to control how people behave. But as you can see from this particular picture, yeah, um, people don't always follow the law. They make their own ethical choices. Every single one of us has the capacity to work out in a particular circumstance what the rights and wrongs of a situation are. And it's interesting to ask ourselves the question is, having created a law that says you should not use your mobile phone, why are all the people in this picture still doing it? We'll look at that through the lens of ethical theory as we go through this lecture. Now, Sheffield Hallam University is a signatory to principles of responsible management education. This is an initiative by the United Nations to encourage business schools to teach business ethics. But I think there's another reason for this, um, particularly since 2008, uh, both the state sector and the private sectors have been shrinking. Yeah? Whereas the sectors that I study, the cooperative economy, the social economy, which comprises social enterprises, employee and businesses, uh, mutual societies, cooperative banks, they have been expanding. And one of the reasons they've been expanding is that people have been exercising their moral choices. They've been making ethical decisions to switch their business, switch their activities into a new type of economy. Alongside that, we have a United Nations commitment to what's called sustainable development. Uh, and for that to succeed, we need people who are willing to create businesses that advance the health and well-being, not just of the business itself, but of the people who work in them, the community that hosts them. And that means that we want business people who are interested in creating businesses that do more than make money. Yeah. And even create a business not with the purpose of making money, but with the purpose of doing something else. And there's a, a, a Nobel Prize winning economist who coined the term social business to describe that type of activity. So principles of responsible management education, I'm not going to dwell on this. This, this is what guides us in preparing our course materials for you. So every one of the courses in the business school now has to describe how it embeds these six principles, how we uh, provide business education uh, that, that helps students to become uh, value creators in a broader sense, not just making money for business, but doing good for people in society. And that means teaching concepts of responsible business, responsible leadership, responsible management, and facilitating a debate between you and between ourselves and the stakeholders that rely on, on the business environment. So these are the six principles that guide us in developing your courses. So ethics, how can we describe ethics? Ethics is the study of how we work out if something is right or wrong, the guiding principles that tell us whether what we're doing is good or bad. Yeah. So if you're going to create a business that is socially responsible, you are going to have to exercise ethical reasoning. Yeah. And there are different systems of ethics, so it's not necessarily straightforward. People bring different processes of reasoning in working out whether something is right or wrong. Yeah. Alongside that, we have the concept of normative values. So a set of normative values are a stable set of beliefs about what is right and wrong. 
It can be normative for the individual, for, the, for their friendship group, for a company. It might be set at um, a regional level by a local government or at a national level by a national government or at a world level by um, you know, bodies that regulate international trade. So normative values are the norms that we create that guide us in terms of whether what we're doing is right or wrong. And there's a huge contention about whether normative values are viable. But for, the, for your purposes, a system of ethics is also a system of normative values. So business ethics, I just want to contrast business ethics with ethical business. So people talk about business ethics. It's about the principles that should guide business activity. It's very much an individual focus. How should people act when they are doing business? What kind of ethical reasoning should they apply when they're making business decisions? So it's about the manager, it's about the entrepreneur. It is about employees too, particularly if they're in challenging situations. Uh, but it's an attempt to create a moral framework that individual people inside business can use to, to guide their behavior. Now, I think that's somewhat different to ethical businesses or ethical business. This is where we're not just individually trying to work out what is right and wrong. It's where we are collectively trying to decide what the business should do. Yeah. Um, it might consciously set out to have an ethical outcome, to do good for founding entrepreneurs, the workforce, the customers, the users of the organization's uh, products and services, the wider investment community, and wider society. So it's an attempt for the, by the people inside a business to establish a moral framework for that business. Yeah, not just for the individuals in the business, but for that business. Now I'm gonna play you a little video here because since, well, for a long time, but particularly since 2008, uh, the private sector has come under a lot of scrutiny for what it calls externalizing. And externalizing is trying to get other people to take responsibility and to get other people to pay for the costs of your business. So I'm just gonna pause and I'm gonna play you a video. To whom do these companies owe um, loyalty? What does loyalty mean? Well. It, it turns out that that was a rather naive concept anyway, as corporations are always owed obligation to themselves to get large and to get profitable. In doing this, it tends to be more profitable to the extent it can make pe other people pay the bills for its impact on society. There's a terrible word that economists use for this called externalities. An externality is... A it is the effect of a transaction between two individuals on a third party who has not consented to or played any role in the carrying out of that transaction. And there are real problems in that area, there's no doubt about it. Running a business is a tough proposition. There are costs to be minimized at every turn. And at some point, the corporation says, you know, let somebody else deal with that. Let's let somebody else supply the military power to the Middle East to protect the oil at its source. Let's let somebody else build the roads that we can drive these automobiles on. Let's let somebody else have those problems. And that is where externalities come from. That notion of let somebody else deal with that. I got all I can handle myself. A corporation is an externalizing machine in the same way that a shark is a killing machine. Each one is designed in a very efficient way to accomplish particular objectives. In the achievement of those objectives, uh, there isn't any question of malevolence or of will. The enterprise has within it and the shark has within it those characteristics that enable it to do that for which it was designed. So the pressure's on the corporation to deliver results now and to externalize any cost that this unwary or uncaring public will allow it to externalize. So externalizing, as shown in that video, um, it's a byproduct of the way that we structure businesses. Uh, most of those people say, you know, the, the business can't help it. Well, actually, 
it's a byproduct of the fact that the people who care about what the business done are not necessarily the owners. The people who own the business may be completely external and they impose uh, rules and conditions on the way that they, the business should operate. And for that reason, it becomes an externalizing machine to make profits for someone. I'm just going to share my screen again with you so that we can return to the, to the history of ethics. So, let's look very, very quick, very, very quickly, look at a little history. Um, Adam Smith is a very well-known figure in our culture. Um, he wrote a book called The Wealth of Nations, trying to understand how wealth was created by the entrepreneurs operating in markets. Now, he had a, a view of um, a society in which there were lots and lots of small producers. So his work has been used by people today to argue for market economy. But he didn't envisage a market economy where we would have multinational companies. He envisaged a market economy when most of us would be in control of producing our own goods and services. So he gets um, criticized for speaking up about the market, but the, the kind of market he wanted was very different to the market we have today. Um, one of the strong critics of Adam Smith was, was Robert Owen. Now, Robert Owen was writing when the Industrial Revolution was happening, so he could begin to see the beginnings of these very large corporations. And he wrote about the cooperative response to the market, where large groups of people join an organization and they intervene collectively into the market. Now, today we know about to the cooperative group, but this also applies to organizations like John Lewis, which provides a much better standard of living for its workforce than the workforces in other supermarkets because they have joined together and created a cooperative endeavor uh, and the wealth goes to the workforce and not to outside shareholders. In the early co-ops, they were very successful. Um, around the turn of the 20th century, about a third of all the groceries in the country uh, were going out through cooperative societies that were locally owned by people who lived there. Today it's about 4%, but in other countries it's as high as 40 or 50%. So while the cooperative movement was stalled in the UK, it's been very, very successful elsewhere. I, I kind of like the work of uh, John Nass. He criticized Adam Smith, because Adam Smith argued that if each person looks after their own self-interest, it creates what he called the invisible hand, that by pursuing your own interest, you're actually also pursuing the good of society. And John Nash said that isn't true. John Nash said, you have to think about your own self-interest at the same time as thinking about the interests of the wider group within which you belong. And he called this equilibrium theory. I need to think about the best outcome for the people around me, as well as the best outcome for myself, or I will not even get the best outcome for myself. Now, John Adam Smith's work was taken up by Margaret Thatcher and lots of people in the 1980s, Ronald Reagan in America, Deng Xiaoping in uh, China. And we have been through a period of what we call neoliberalism, extreme individualism. Yeah. That has gradually made way. It started with Tony Blair, but it's really accelerated since we went into the period of austerity. People today do not believe that the systems of business are fit for purpose. And one of the reasons is that we've had 40 years of thinking that individuals looking after themselves and only themselves somehow leads to a greater good. Uh, and I think we are now seeing a change of, of, of thinking uh, that we need to think about uh, the good of the people around us at the same time as ourselves in order to create sustainable businesses for the future. So one of the ways that that manifests itself is in the debate between shareholders and stakeholders. So shareholders are the people who have bought a share, a share being a share of the wealth, yeah? So they have an entitlement to dividends and they have entitlement to the value of the company should it ever be sold or closed, yeah? But a stakeholder is somebody who has an interest in the organization. They're internally, they're the workforce members, the family entrepreneurs, um, externally, they are customers, they are people who might uh, invest in the business through the stock market, they're also the local community, the government, people like that. 
There's a lot of debate about whether we should run organizations in the interest of shareholders, which typically means institutional investors and founding entrepreneurs, or in the interest of stakeholders, which means usually the customers, the employees, wider society and, and the state. Anyone who is engaged in a debate about business ethics or ethical business is going to think about whether you get better outcomes from a shareholder run business or a stakeholder run business. And a lot of my work is actually engaged in enfranchising more stakeholders so that they become shareholders through what we call the fair shares model. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So stakeholders and ethical business. What I want to do is introduce you to one of the companies I've been working with. We're going to watch a video uh, prepared by somebody called Rob Jameson. Rob Jameson's an American. He worked with an Australian called Eric Dorian, and he is the chief executive of AnyShare. The company AnyShare wants to create an entirely new business model that is based on stakeholders and ethical commitments in order to share the wealth amongst uh, everybody who is involved in the creation of wealth rather than just a small select group of private investors. And they've applied what we've developed here at Sheffield Hallam, something called the Fair Shares Model. So I'll let him speak to you now. The path of human history radically changed 10,000 years ago during the Neolithic period. During this time, people went from being hunters and gatherers to growing crops, thus creating a surplus of food for the first time in human history. The freeing up of labor made way for technological advances, but also created the need for a leader's class to manage this extra activity. Over time, an inequality between the leading members and everyone else started to grow. So fast forward to today, and massive wealth and income inequality has become the norm. The corporations of today play a very large part in this inequality. To illustrate how things could be different, just imagine the hundreds of billions of dollars that Apple, Microsoft, and Google alone have at hand. Just these three companies alone could single-handedly end world hunger if their cash stockpiles were shared equitably. Modern day businesses are built by four stakeholder groups. Founders, investors, employees, and customers. We believe that all four of these shareholder groups are needed to have a voice in the direction of the company and to share in its profits. Not sharing voting and profit with all the stakeholder groups perpetuates inequality within the community. I'm very proud to say that Mass Mosaic has decided to become the first internet fair shares company. As Mass Mosaic grows and earns surplus profits, instead of them being returned to investors only or sitting in the bank, they're going to be returned to all stakeholder groups, including our members. The ability to have a voice in the direction of an up-and-coming company that is set in stone in the company's structure is unheard of with the status quo. By contributing to a company that's equitable at its core, people can trust that they are being part of the solution to a widespread inequality that we see today. Making Mass Mosaic a success will spur others to go down this path. And widespread adoption will right a wrong that's been over 10,000 years in the making. Okay, so I, I had uh, a chance to meet Eric. He came, sorry, uh, uh, Rob Jameson rather. He came to the UK and he spent a couple of weeks here while we worked on a project and he told me about the place he lived. It's called Arcasanti. Arcasanti is a community where people pay very little for their housing, almost nothing for their food because they build their houses and they grow their food collectively. Now this isn't a rural community, this is a modern community um, and it's supported by an American foundation to um, show architects how to build new communities and new businesses that are entirely sustainable. So let me now share my screen again with you um, and we'll return to the question of uh, theory around this field. So let's leave Eric behind. 
and we go. So, one of the first papers I wrote around ethics was the concept of ethical capital. It was an attempt by myself and a colleague to understand why, for example, the Eden Project in Cornwall was so successful. So, the Eden Project is a visitor attraction that its founders say has put more money into the southwest of England than all of the grants from national and European governments. So a single enterprise has catalyzed economic activity in that region. And the founder of the Eden Project called Tim Schmidt went to a conference, a social enterprise conference, and talked about ethical capital. He said, this is why people come and work here, because we have ethical capital. So what did he mean by that? Well, Mike Bull and I wrote a paper and we looked at the literature and we found that people differentiate what they call level one, two, and three. So at level one, um, businesses have a minimal amount of thinking about ethics. And in fact, in some books, uh, particularly by Lash and Conway, they frame these enterprises as unethical businesses for, for failing to engage with ethics at all. A lot of traditional nonprofits make their decisions based on whether the investment makes money or not, and they're not thinking about um, the ethical capital, the social capital, the human capital, the intellectual capital um, that they're going to produce from that activity. More and more organizations are practicing corporate social responsibility, and we can be critical of whether that is genuine or whether it's uh, just a way of satisfying the public and avoiding criticism but certainly I work with a lot of organizations that would be at what we would call level three socially responsible businesses this is businesses whose purpose is to uh, meet one of the challenges a social challenge or an environmental challenge it might be renewable energy it might be uh, providing social care it might be providing housing in a different way it might be just restructuring organizations to distribute wealth differently. a lot of cooperatives I think would fall into the socially responsible business category but then as you go across you have uh, other types of enterprise they might trade quite a bit uh, but they might be constituted as charities or as associations so they have a structure uh, that means that they seek not to distribute profits but they're all social purpose businesses they're all trying to do a social purpose some of them don't take profits out and distribute them some of them do then we have charitable enterprises those that have to meet the stringent criteria for what constitutes a charity um, the difference here is they must be a public benefit from their operation now sometimes it's hard to see the public benefit that some charities produce, but the law has been tightened up a lot in the last five or six years to um, try to ensure that people do not get charitable status unless there's a genuine public benefit. And then we have what I would call charitable activities, and these are different from charitable enterprises. Charitable activities just invest in doing social good, whereas a charitable enterprise trades to produce social good. So, for example, the big issue where people sell newspapers in order to change the lives of people who are homeless, that's a charitable enterprise. It's constituted as a charity, but there's a lot of trading activity. Charitable activities might just be um, raising money through fundraising events and then investing them in a particular project that provides education or shelter or something. But there's no actual trading in the charitable activity. Now, corporate social responsibility and social enterprise, there can be a, a tricky line between the two. And when I travel around the world talking about social enterprise, people often ask me, well, isn't this just CSR with another name? Corporate social responsi responsibility is an add-on to the basic business, whereas social enterprise means that the business itself has a purpose. It has to define its social purpose in its constitution or in its mission statement. Ethics are central and the founding principles of the business in a bona fide social enterprise. So we can look at a continuum from criminal behavior, behavior that breaks the acceptable standards of society to behavior that meets the legislative requirements, the minimum acceptable standard of behavior. Most of our behavior is probably to the right of that line, not all of it. 
Um, then we have people who proactively seek to be ethical. They engage in ethical behaviors. They practice corporate social responsibility. They try to ensure that their organizations not just, don't just follow the law, but they improve on the legal minimum. And then we have ethical businesses who actually establish themselves around an ethical purpose and commit themselves to a form of social enterprise. Now I'm going to play you, well, I don't, actually I don't think I will play you this video. I just want to touch base with uh, Immanuel Kant. He's a very influential um, ethicist, philosopher, and he argued that we should not engage in any behavior that we wouldn't want done to us. And he called this the categorical imperative. Yeah? So if, if we could imagine um, ourselves replicate, our behavior replicated around society, would we approve of that behavior being carried on in all places? And if we don't approve of that behavior, going on, we shouldn't engage in it in the first place. So there's an absolute test here under Kant's categor categorical imperative as to whether a particular behavior is ethical or not. Uh, and therefore, it's a standard. It leads to a sort of normative um, view of whether a particular behavior is good or not. So he, he um, very associated with ethics, but this is all again about whether an individual should engage in behavior, but you can also see that if you can apply this to create a universal standard and a normative set of ethical values across society. I want to contrast Kant with the work of Jeremy Bentham, which is probably at the other extreme. He argued that uh, something is ethical, um, if it creates the greatest good for the greatest number of people. So something is ethical, not because of some absolute moral standard, but because you can benefit a great number of people. I'm gonna show you a, play you a short clip from a well-known um, comedy series. It's not one that I watch a great deal, but um, I think you'll get the message. Gentlemen, switching to local nerd news, Fishman, Chen, Chowdhury, and McNair aren't fielding a team in the University Physics Bowl this year. You're kidding, why not? They formed a barbershop quartet and got a gig playing Knott's Berry Farm. <laughs> wow, so in your world, you're like the cool guys. Recognize. <laughs> well, this is our year. With those guys out, the entire Physics Bowl will kneel before Zod. Zod? Kryptonian villain, long story. Good story. Well, count me out. What? Why? You want me to use my intelligence in a tawdry competition? Would you ask Picasso to play Pictionary? <laughs> Would you ask Noah Webster to play Boggle? <laughs> Would you ask Jacques Cousteau to play Go Fish? Come on, you need a four-person team. We're four people. By that reasoning, we should also play bridge, hold up a hoopa, and enter the Olympic bobsled competition. <laughs> Tickets to that, please. Sheldon, what? Do I need to quote Spock's dying words to you? No, don't. <laughs> the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one. Damn it, I'll do it. So we've had two extremes. We've had extreme individualism, which guides the individual and their, their own absolute moral authority. We've had extreme collectivism which looks at uh, how individuals should subordinate their own needs to the needs of the group. The, in the next slide, I want to introduce the third and final uh, view of ethics for this level, which is virtue ethics. So let me just share my screen again with you. So here we've got um, a set of ethical beliefs and What's interesting is they take the form of sort of normative values and they have a, a strongly religious uh, sort of background or connotation to them. I want you to look very closely at these words because in a moment I'm going to show you a quote about social entrepreneurship where you'll see things like fortitude and justice and hope uh, surfacing in the defi def definition of what social entrepreneur is. So it implies that a social entrepreneur is somebody who has these virtues, and that's only one view. I'm going to then counterpoise that with a view that takes a more collective perspective. So let's look at a well-known definition of social entrepreneurship. This uh, is by some people from Stanford University, 
Uh, and they say three components, identifying something that is unjust, which causes exclusion or marginalization, um, but that the people in that situation do not have either the financial or political means to bring about a transformation. So the social entrepreneur takes that situation, develops a, what they call a social value proposition, and then they bring these virtues, creativity, inspiration, direct action, courage, fortitude, the very words that we saw in the virtue ethics um, lexicon. And they use their own energy to forge a new stable equilibrium. You can see how the ethical action here is considered to be primarily the action of the entrepreneur. Yeah. Um, and they try to create a new equilibrium and lift a particular target group out of poverty or desperation. So just to summarize where we've got to so far, we've distinguished business ethics, which is got a focus on individual moral choices and ethical businesses, where we, a group of people, um, agree together about the purpose of their organization and its impact. And we can also now, I think, distinguish between private enterprise and entrepreneurship, where there is little engagement with the idea that business itself can be constituted as an ethical business, and social enterprise and social entrepreneurship, where being ethical is the raison d'etre of business, you know, doing something that is good for people, society, or the environment. But I want to start to finish with some of my own research and this is the difference between privatization and the creation of injustice or unjust equilibria and socialization the create creation of justice through business now there are some good examples we can use here so if you think of traditional copyright encyclopedia britannica patents this is a form of intellectual property that privatizes the property rights creative commons wikipedia open source software these socialize, these open up ownership and control of intellectual property to a much, much greater number of people. And therefore it creates a much more just system in my view. You can look at that in, in terms of the businesses. So Marks and Spencer is very different from John Lewis. IBM is very different from Mindvalley. Yeah. These are examples of businesses that privatize against those businesses that open up ownership to many more people. And there's a knock-on effect here if you apply that thinking to um, natural resources. So British Gas, Bechtel seek to privatise. Bechtel is an incredible film called Even the Rain. Yeah, it's about a South American city where Bechtel privatised the rain and then they charge the citizens for rainwater. Yeah. Very different to a community or cooperative energy project, such many of them in Denmark, Germany, Africa, um, where energy is uh, collectively um, generated and collectively shared. So it's, it's shared through a cooperative system and any surpluses or benefits, wealth benefits from that process are also shared. And then you've got people like Arsenal versus Barcelona. Arsenal is owned by two people. Barcelona is owned by, at the last count, 170,000 people, the fans, the people who buy the season tickets. And you've got the same with the other examples here. Enron, a private company or a company that privatizes Semco in South America, opens up membership, allows a lot of stakeholder control and employee control. So that's pretty much the end of the lecture today. Just want to finish with a couple of questions for you, something for you to think about while you're uh, doing this particular lecture seminar series. Should businesses exist for their own purposes? just for their own benefit, for the good of society? Or should they exist to improve the people who participate in them and, and host uh, the community, the host community? And also imagine if you were um, in government and you were a regulator of business, what categorical imperative would you apply in deciding whether a business can continue trading? At the moment, it's pretty much do you make money? If you continue to make money and you can pay your debts, you can keep trading. Is there any other criteria that you might apply uh, in order to make a decision as a regulator whether a business continues to trade? 
So thank you very much. I'm just going to leave you uh, to have a look at some of the materials. Um, and I hope we have helped you with the under idea of private enterprise, mutual enterprise and social enterprise in the course of this lecture. So here are some resources that you can look at to further your understanding of this area.